Thank you, Ellie, for reading for us this morning. Uh, good morning and welcome to God's Tribe. Thank you for coming here on this very rainy day. It's so dark in here. I think we're going to all have to fight taking a nap today in church. Uh, but we have an amazing story this week. Oh, these, these next few Sundays are really the, the pinnacle of all of Scripture. It's what has been, all of Scripture has really been building towards these coming moments, these coming chapters that we are going to be looking at. And as I'm sure you can gather from what Ellie just read for us today, we are going to be looking at the trial of Jesus. Uh, and we see that there's, there's multiple stages really to this trial that we see Jesus going through. Uh, but again, these are the, these chapters. We're in dark times right now in Scripture. Last week, we, Arthur spoke about the, the betrayal of Jesus by one of his own 12 disciples. Today, we're looking at the trial of Jesus. And then in the following weeks, we will we'll see what happens with his crucifixion upcoming and the resurrection. But before we get to the, ex, the, the wonderful news of Christ's resurrection, there's these really dark moments. And it's sad and, it's, and it can be hard to read. But also it's something we're familiar with. And so I urge you this morning that even though this is something that is familiar, this is something you've most likely heard before, I, I hope that you can, can uh, open your ears this morning to hear from God's Word. This is uh, one of the few things that is actually covered in every single gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all talk in some form about Jesus' trial. And so we're going to skip around a bit this morning as we do this. And it's going to be a little bit of a different service because you're not going to see, I know normally I have like points for you that I put up on the screen, like some takeaways. You're not going to have that this morning. We're just going to look at a lot of different scripture and we're going to look at this trial. And I think that the, the, the point of, of all of this will stick out clearly to each and every one of us at the end. But before we get into the text for today, I did want to start by reading first. We're going to go back a little ways in our Bibles, and I'm going to go to Deuter Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 18 through 20. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 18 through 20. It says this, you shall appoint judges, this is as they're entering the promised land, and officers in all towns that the Lord your God is giving you, according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice, you shall not show partiality, and you shall not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the calls of the righteous. Justice, and only justice, you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Justice, and only justice, you shall follow. These are the directions from God to His people. The Jewish Sanhedrin system, which is primarily who we see, we see Jesus before the Sanhedrin and before Pilate and Herod back to Pilate. But at the whole time, the Sanhedrin the religious leaders are the ones calling for the execution of Jesus. We talked about previously how the, the Sanhedrin was made up of 71 members. San, 71 members. And really, the Sanhedrin system of justice was incredibly advanced. It was incredibly advanced. Uh, in many ways, it, it, it may be even superior to, to the systems of justice that we see today. Uh, for example, they, they were very committed, as you see, to not only justice, but they were committed to mercy. It was of the utmost importance to them that they not only were just, but that they were merciful. Because we serve a merciful God. Their belief was that they existed not to destroy life, but to save it. Wow. 
and they had a well-known saying. It was uh, almost like their, their motto, that if we err, we err towards mercy. We err for mercy. They did not want to ever... Uh, it, it was like, you, you know, you did everything you can to make sure you never convicted an innocent person, really, is what it, it, their system was like. Uh, the way that charges were brought is that, that out, people outside the Sanhedrin were the ones that brought charges. Nowadays, we see a lot of times like the state or the, the, go, the, the government is the one that brings up the charges, but that is not how it worked. Instead, the people brought charges and the Sanhedrin would sit and listen and they were judge and jury, but it was not fair for them to be judge, jury, and prosecution. And so they, they would hear the complaints of those outside. Uh, another thing is that you could not condemn yourself. Even if I came forward, right? We hear about people giving confessions, right, to, to crimes. But you could not condemn yourself. You had to have at least one other person to verify what you were saying. And if anyone brought information forward and they accused you of something, there had to be at least one other person to confirm what you were giving testimony of. Again, this means that you could not be condemned based on your own testimony. There was always corroboration needed from outside sources. They were not supposed to, their trials, they, they weren't supposed to go through the night. So if you were, if you were having a trial of some sort and it began to get late, you were to, to cut it off and pick it up the next day. You were to cut it off and pick it up the next day. Another thing is that they weren't supposed to start after midday because they realized that people would want to get home, they would want to wrap up this trial and be done with it. And so if it was past midday, they weren't even allowed to begin because they did not want to risk justice. They wanted justice in every circumstance and they didn't want any outside influence to play in, to, to, to creep in and ruin justice. If their decision, this one, this one got me, if their decision was unanimous, then the accused was to be set free. Because it was thought that, that there was no way that in 20, you had, you had a, again, you had 71 members, but you had to have at least 22 to, to have like quorum, to be able to hold a court. And they had to have 13 of them, of the, 20, of the 22 agree, uh, either guilty or innocent, or, or, or guilty for the person to be found guilty. But if it was unanimous, the person was to be set free because they, there had to have been some kind of collusion. There's no way that you can get 22 people to all agree on something. And so there was assumed that there was some kind of bribery or backhanded dealing going on if all 23, 22 members were to find someone guilty. And it was considered incredibly unmerciful. Another thing is that when they found someone guilty, if they came forward and they had the votes needed to find someone guilty, they were to announce that they had found this person guilty, and then for 24 hours, they were to stay at the, at the, where they had delivered the verdict. And during that 24 hours, they were not allowed to leave. They were not allowed to eat. They were to fast for 24 hours and prayerfully consider what they had just delivered, the judgment that they had just delivered. Not only that, the punishment that they decreed was not to happen for three days. To give people opportunity to come forward with new information. Remember, this is Bible times. So often, you know, it took time for word to spread. So they would stay for three days, they would wait, and they would hope that maybe new people came forward with more information. And if they did, and someone came with new information that was valuable, the whole thing was to start over again. They were committed to justice and to mercy. However, after three days, if everything remained the same, no new information comes. The person, this seems humiliating, but it was actually for the benefit of the person. They would, they would send a writer ahead who would yell and call out who was being accused who had accused them, and what they had been found guilty of. And that person 
walked behind them, a long ways behind, and this person would yell out all of those details. And it was, again, giving an opportunity for those in the community who maybe didn't know what was going on to hear, wait, what's going on? And you could literally run up to the, the, the man on the horse and say, I have some information that might be helpful about this. And if that happened, they were to turn around and ride back, and you were to begin the process again. And up to five times, the person that is being marched to their punishment could actually say, hey, I forgot to say something. And if the person found that, that information valuable, then they were to turn around and go back and present that information to, the, to the, those that had, had given the initial verdict. It was a system set up to be just and merciful. Another interesting fact is that if you were caught giving false testimony, if you were caught giving false testimony, your punishment for giving false testimony was whatever the punishment would have been for the person that you were accusing. So if you were testifying against someone whose punishment would be death, and you were caught giving false testimony, you were to be put to death for your false testimony. There was an extreme weight for the per people that brought charges against someone. You were to realize the seriousness of what you were doing. And not only that, if the person was found guilty, the people that had brought the charges that had testified against this person were to be the first to deliver the blows. So if it was a beating that they received, you would be the one to deliver the first strikes. If the person was condemned to death by stoning, you were the one that had to go and pick up a rock and throw the first stone. It gives new meaning to the story where Jesus draws the line and says, let he who is without sin throw the first stone. He's saying if you're going to accuse then you got to be the one. You're given the testimony. Pick up the rock and throw the first stone. So even those that were bringing charges, there was an extreme seriousness. Committed to justice, but committed to mercy. If we err, let us err towards mercy. So the Sanhedrin system was designed to work and to be full of justice and full of mercy. But we see that throughout the arrest and the trial of Jesus, every rule and law was broken. Every system in place to ensure a righteous justice was ignored and disposed of because the trial of Jesus was not about justice and they knew it wasn't about justice. It was about punish, it wasn't about punishing a guilty person. But the religious leaders feared Jesus. They feared him. They feared his followers and they were not out to even simply punish Jesus. They wanted him dead. We see from what we read this morning, Pilate says, let me punish him. And they're like, no, we don't want him punished. We want him dead. But why? Why did they fear Jesus? Why did they, they so desperately want him dead? They give a reason in John chapter 11. John chapter 11 you turn there in your Bibles. We're going to read verses 45 through 48. John chapter 11, verse 45 to 48. This is what it says. I apologize. I'm going to have to go quickly this morning because I have a lot to get through. But it says this. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary. This is right after the, oh, sorry, important fact. This is right after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. So he's raised his, his friend Lazarus from the dead. Then Jesus, oh, sorry. Wrong, wrong spot. Verse 40, 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, 
who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some then went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Both our place and our nation. The reason that they are giving as a motive is, is, is they're, over, they're, they're over Roman rule right now, right? They're un, I'm sorry, they're under Roman rule right now. And Rome kind of had a unique relationship when they would come in and they would overthrow places. If you consider some of the previous things, like when the Babylonians came in, they came, they killed your way of life, and they dragged off a lot of people because they wanted to make you Babylonians, right? Rome came in and, and they didn't really do that as much. They came in and they tried to, uh, after initially like completely destroying you, right? They came in and they're like, hey, if you behave, we'll let you hold on to some of your traditions and some of your ways of life right? But just know that we are in charge, right? But we'll let you hold on. We'll let you keep your religion. We'll let you keep your your customs and things like that. But just know that we're in charge. So they, they kind of allowed a certain amount of freedom in the lands that they overthrew. But the one thing they did not take kindly to because of that was uprisings. If you tried to, to cause problems and stir up mischief and, and to overthrow the Roman rule that had come in, then you were going to pay severely because they wanted you to know that to not let it happen again, right? This is not something you want to be a part of. We will come in and all of the, 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 the nice things we've allowed you to keep, we're going to take those away. And you are going to pay for any uprising or any insurrection. And so the, the, the religious leaders are saying, we are afraid that Jesus, because of all these things he's doing, people are going to begin to follow him. And they're going to think he's the Messiah, right? And, and then there's going to be an insurrection. There's going to be this uprising. But really, let's, let's look at verse 48 again. It says, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. He's just raised someone from the dead, by the way. Yet they do not believe. Says this, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Our place. Our nation. The truth is, and you'll actually see it about 40 years after Christ's death, that the religious leaders would have been happy for the people to rise up against the Roman rule. But the problem was, is at the end of the day, they wanted the power afterwards. They didn't want to be under a Roman rule. But they were afraid of losing their power. Sadly, the priests of Jesus' time were not uh, godly men leading the people, but they were instead had become more like a religious mafia. It's really what it has become. Two times before Jesus' crucifixion, once at the beginning of his ministry and once towards the end, Jesus enters the temple and he casts out money changers and he causes a big scene and he talks about how it's become a den of, of thieves And what is going on here is that I I never really realized what money changers were, and I never really put much thought into it, but the the money changers, to even come and give an offering in the temple, you couldn't just come with your your normal money, right? So you couldn't just come and put your shillings in in the basket. No, before you came in, you had to exchange your money for temple money. So... All right, and, and, and guess who got to set the exchange rate for changing your, your perfectly good money that you can spend outside the walls of the temple and the, the temple money? The priest did. So they would come and, and, and to even give an offering, 
you had to first change your real money into temple money. So it's like you're double offering, right? You're, you're, you're getting ripped off as you exchange into temple money, and then you're being, giving that money back to them. So they're getting double portions, and they're loving it, right? This is great for them. But not only that, it is, it, it, history says that people stopped bringing their own animals to sacrifice. People stopped bringing them because they knew that if they came with their own animal, the priest who got to inspect the animals and determine if they were worthy to be sacrificed would always find something wrong. Hey, this animal's not good enough. This one's got, you see this, it's, you know, you can't do that one. But what do you know? Who sells pre-approved animals for sacrifice? The priest did. But go change your money first to temple money, then you can come and you can buy your pre-approved little, little lamb to sacrifice. And again, you're paying double the price for the lamb. You're paying extra to convert your money outside to temple money that you can only use in the temple. It had really become a mafia almost of sorts. They had become not only incredibly powerful, they were incredibly wealthy. And we see this in Jesus' trial because it talks about how he's taken to the house of Annas, and we'll get into this in a moment, but Annas and and Caiaphas live on the same compound, and it sounds like it is a palace. This is a huge place because there's a lot of people just waiting in the courtyard. So the courtyard is huge. Who knows how big the house itself was? So they are becoming extremely rich and wealthy from the offerings and the sacrifice of the people. The money that's supposed to be for God, the sacrifices that are supposed to be for God, are instead being abused and used so that they can get more power and get more wealth. Again, what is set up to be a system that is set up to be full of justice and mercy. But everything is about to be broken in the trial of Jesus. They're not leading the people to follow and obey God, but they're using their own people for selfish gain. And they want Jesus dead. Because he has twice now come into their temple, turned over tables. People are following him. He's healing people. He's not in it for the money. All the money that he gets, he's using to to help others. What is up with this guy? He doesn't even have a house, nowhere to lay his head. And they go home to their palaces. And they've begun to do anything they can to be able to kill Jesus. The first thing they do is that they pay a bribe to someone in order to find out where he is. Right? What what did we read? The first thing in Deuteronomy. It's about not not accepting bribes, but they're not only probably accepting bribes, now they're paying out bribes, and they're like, bring him to us. Show us where he is. They're out for blood. Let's read chapter, uh, John, from John, excuse me, John chapter 18. So Jesus is arrested. This is all just set up, and I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm really going to have to pick up the pace. All right, so the, uh, so. Jesus has been arrested. The first place he goes, John chapter 18, 12 to 14, and then we're going to skip and we're going to read verses 19 to 24. It says this, uh, verse 12, so the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest for that year. Paul's high priest for that year. That is not a normal thing, and that is actually very unbiblical, but Annas had been high priest for a long time. And and the high priest was to be high priest for life. So high priest for that year doesn't make any sense. 
but it's again showing the corruption that is going on. But Jesus is first brought to Annas, who's been demoted from high priest, because when the Romans came in, he caused some troubles, and they're like, you can't be high priest anymore. But not only was Caiaphas high priest for that year, uh, history says that, that he had five sons, and, and apparently all five of the sons at some point were high priests too. So they just, it was in the family. And Caiaphas is his son-in-law, just so you know. Caiaphas is his son-in-law. But we see who's actually in charge, because who's the first person they bring Jesus to. Not even Caiaphas, the high priest for the year, but they go back and they, they bring him to Annas, who has been demoted from high priest, but is the unofficial godfather of the priestly group, right? He's the one really calling the shots. And so they bring him to, here we go, picking back up. Uh, so first they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest for that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the, that uh, advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Skip ahead to verse 19. The high priest, then this is Annas still. He's not at Caiaphas's yet. The high priest then questioned Jesus about, and I notice it calls him high priest, about his disciples and his teaching. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard, heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Again, he calls him high priest when he's not really high priest. Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. I thought he was the high priest. It just called him high priest, right? So you see already all the shady things that are going on within this priestly community. But Jesus, in this circumstance, he's brought and he's like, hey, what have you been teaching? And he's like, I teach in synagogues and in the temple, openly, where everybody can hear. I haven't said anything in secret. And Jesus knew the law that he can't incriminate himself. And he's like, go find people. Go find them. Ask them what I've taught. He knows the law. But essentially what he's saying here is do your job. You're not even, one, you've, you've illegally arrested me. Right? He's bound. He has no, nobody's brought charges against him. But what are they doing? They're making themselves judge, jury, and they're also making themselves the prosecutors of this crime, which is against the law. But they've bound him. Jesus, they're asking him questions, and he's like, hey, do your job. Go find people. Guess what? They're not going to have anything against me because I haven't said anything in secret. I haven't done anything I shouldn't do. And when he says that, he gets smacked, right? He's hit for the first time for telling them to follow the law. Do what you're supposed to do. Follow the law. He knows the law. He knows what they're supposed to do. So after this run-in with Annas, the not high priest, high priest, Jesus is then sent to his puppet high priest, Caiaphas. So here's what they've done so far. They've questioned Jesus illegally. They can't find anything wrong, so they're digging for it. They're like, hey, give us something to go with here. They can't find anything. He refuses to incriminate himself, again, which is illegal. They need two witnesses. And when he refuses, he's struck. There's no justice being sought in this, in this circumstance. There is no rule of law that is being followed. This, again, I, it's, it reminded me so much. It, it is a mafia out for blood. They want him dead. They're trying to get rid of an inconvenience because he is a bother to their business. Next, let's look at Mark chapter 14. This is the next stage. Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, and I'm going to read verses 53 through 60. Again, I have a lot to go through here, so I apologize for the speed at which I will be talking. Mark chapter 14, verse 53 through 60. It says this. 
and they led Jesus to the high priest, Caiaphas, <laughs> just so you're not confused because it keeps calling multiple people high priest, um, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together, all of them. This is crazy, right? Because no, how many do you need to, have, to be able to have a trial? 23. 71 of them show up, plus others, because they're like, we finally got him, right? Come together, and Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. This is, again, this is a ginormous house. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priest and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy the temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet, even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you, in, have you no answer to make? Pause. <laughs> they have no charges to bring. They've made themselves prosecutors, judge, jury. They've bribed the disciple to portray Jesus. They've sought, now they've sought false, false witnesses. Now they're going out and they're actively seeking people to come forward and to lie. But they're trying to really rush this thing. You notice they've got, like, they're putting some pace on it. They're, they're, they're trying to pump it because they don't want Jesus' followers to hear about what is going on. They're in a hurry to get this done because they know that there are a lot of people that like this Jesus guy. And they're like, we've got to get this thing done quick. So what have they done? They've, they've gone a trial through the night like they're not supposed to. They've... Uh, they're now carrying it on the next day. They're seeking false witnesses, but because they're in such a hurry, they can't even let them get their lies straight. But what's supposed to happen to people that come and bear false witness? If they're trying to kill Jesus, those that were bearing false witness should have been immediately marched out and put to death for bearing false witness. But we just, all of a sudden, we don't care about false witness being brought anymore. Because we're trying to get something done. The punishment was to match that of the accused, but these people are just, uh, man, all right, thanks, but no thanks. And in this, these people, we see that he said, you know, he's talking about the, the, when Jesus said, you know, I'll, I'll rebuild the temple, talking about his body, right, in three days. Uh, they don't even get that story right, but unknowingly, the priests are bringing to pass exactly what Jesus was talking about when he talked about that. These false witnesses can't even agree. They repeatedly ask Jesus to give a defense of what he's heard, but how in the world do you give a defense when someone's clearly lying, right? Like, how do you... They're not even agreeing. So what am I supposed to defend myself against when it's false testimony and these people can't even agree on what they're talking about? But they're like, what do you have to say? And Jesus, in accordance with Scripture and in wisdom, sits there quietly. Isaiah 53, like a lamb to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. False witness. I'm not even going to answer it. Go and find those that have heard me. And you see they don't bring anyone in his defense, right? Jesus, what did he, what did he say? Go find people. But no, they're not looking for legitimate testimony. Instead, they're out searching for those that will lie on their behalf. Mark chapter 14. Back to Mark. Mark chapter 14. Verse 61 to 65. But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? 
And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witness do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! And the guards received him with blows. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? The one question that Jesus finally answers. They have nothing left to bring against him. This is the final straw. Their final thing they have that they can pull out to try to get him. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And they've saved this one for last on purpose because they know that Rome, who's, who's a permission they need to kill Jesus, by the way, they know they need their permission, and they know that Rome won't ki- care about blasphemy because they have all kinds of gods. So who cares if this guy says he's one? So they instead, they've saved this one for last, and they're, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? I am. And that answer should sound familiar to each and every one of us because what does God tell Moses on the mountain when he says, who shall I tell them has sent me? I am that I am has sent you. It is the same words in Greek. I am. And they knew what he was saying. He was not only responding in the positive answer that I am the Christ, the Son of the Blessed, but he's saying, I am the I am. And that is why we receive the response that we see from them. But Jesus didn't stop there. He said, he follows that up and he says, and Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus is saying, what's, what's the right hand of power? That is where justice is delivered. That is where judgment comes from. Jesus is saying, you're judging me right now, but one day I will judge you. They think that they are judging Jesus, but he will one day judge them. If Jesus had remained silent, but for one more question, they would have had to let him go. They had nothing left to bring against him. If he had simply remained silent, avoided the question. But this is the very moment for which Jesus was born. A spotless lamb born for the slaughter. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The I am. They accused Christ of blasphemy, but as they accuse Christ of blasphemy, they are guilty of the worst blasphemy the world has ever seen. As they deny who Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and they begin to beat him and mock him. Again, they believe they are judging Jesus, but one day they will stand before him in judgment. They then take Jesus before Pilate, and I've got to make this next part super quick. This is actually a really long part. Go and read this this week. But Luke chapter 23, I'm not going to read it. This is, that's what was read for us this morning. They bring 
him before Pilate again, and just I want to give you some background because it makes this so much more interesting because you see this, this tension between Pilate and the Jewish leaders. And you're like, Pilate is the one in charge. What is going on? Why is he bowing to their desires? But so a couple interesting things that history tells us is that as Pilate came into power, he marched into town with his crew and he had on poles a bust of Caesar Augustus. And Caesar was considered a deity. And so as he comes in, he brings these things in and he sets them up. And if there's one thing that the Jewish people did not tolerate after the exile, it was idolatry. idolatry. And so they're like, you cannot have those things here. You cannot have those. And they harass him for weeks. They harass him. And he gets incredibly sick of it, and he says, hey, we're going to meet in the, in the, uh, in the, I can't think of what it's called, the, the, where they would go and give speeches, and it was like dug out so everyone could hear. Uh, I can't think of what it's called. Anyway, they, they all went there, and he said, meet me there, we're going to talk this thing out, right? So they all come, all the religious leaders, and he comes up to speak, and all of a sudden, here come all the Roman soldiers surrounding this place, and he says, leave me alone or I'm going to cut every last one of your heads off. But they knew, right? If there's one thing Rome avoids, it's conflict when they've already conquered somewhere. They don't want to have to send more troops. And if you kill us, there's going to be an uprising. So they all undo their robes and say, go for it. They called his bluff. And in his first few weeks... As governor, he is humiliated because he has to take his statues down, and they won. Not only that, he then, for revenge, takes some shields with the image of Caesar on him, and he places them outside the temple. And they again tell him to take him down. He doesn't. They decide to humiliate him further, and they write a letter to Caesar. And they tell tell him, the kind of things that Pilate is doing. Hey, this guy is trying to stir up problems. Just, we're just trying to worship. Why is he doing this? And again, he is humiliated to get a letter from Caesar commanding him to remove these shields and and, and being like, why are you doing, why are you doing this? Why are you causing me more work? I got enough going on. He's been humiliated twice by this group. And what they have proven in both circumstances is that you may think you're in charge, Pilate, but we're in charge. We're still in charge. We even see this back to John 18, verse 28 and 29. They're bringing Jesus to him. There's a few things we learn from this, but verse 28 to 29 says, Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them. They're like, hey, uh, we got something we need you to deal with, but we're not going to come inside because we want to eat Passover later. And he comes out to them. They make the governor come out to them outside his own house because they will not enter. Who's in charge? They are. They're in charge. And how crazy that as they are committing the greatest injustice ever, they are still worried about their ceremonial cleanness. Right? I want to be able to eat that meal later. And and guess what? And another interesting fact is that it's not even against the law of Moses to enter a Gentile's home. That's not something that made you unclean. They made that up. It was just another way for them to build themselves up and create further separation. So it wasn't even a rule, but it was something that, you know, we're very important people. We're very holy. We're very righteous. We will not enter the house of a Gentile person. They're more worried about ceremonial cleanness than they are about true justice and mercy. They have appearances to keep up, though. So they make him come outside to them. Pilate then takes them to Herod because he's trying to get out of it. He's like, please, Herod, give me, like, give me a break, man. But they don't, 
they haven't liked each other apparently up to this point, but he takes them to him anyways, and he's like, hey, they're wanting to kill this Jesus guy, what do you think? And he's like, ah, I don't think, you know, they make fun of him a little bit, and they're like, but I don't really think he's done anything. I, cool, go with him. So Pilate's like, oh man, I still am stuck trying to make this decision now. So then Pilate returns, he's like, hey, I, I can't find anything wrong. I think it is four or four times that I counted that Pilate says like, Hey, I can't find anything. Let me punish him and release him. And they're like, no, we want him dead. No. Pilate tries to pawn it off. They keep coming back to him. But finally, until finally in, in Luke 23, verse 24 to 25 that we read already this morning, Pilate decided their demand should be granted. He released the man. This was his last thing, right? His last ditch effort was to bring out Barabbas. He brings out Barabbas. Because what are they accusing Jesus of? He's trying to cause an insurrection. He's trying to stir people up and cause problems. And so how convenient that Pilate happens to have someone that's actually guilty of that same thing. But not only that, he's killed some people in the process. And so he says, hey, who do you want? Jesus, who you're saying has done this stuff, but obviously never has? Or do you want Barabbas, who's actually done it and committed murder on top of that? You're accusing Jesus of this, and here's someone who's actually done what you're so worried about. Verse 25, he released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. He delivered Jesus over to their will. They didn't care about an insurrection. It was just a way to get what they wanted, which was Jesus dead. Another interesting thing that I don't have time to get into, but remember last week Arthur talked about where Judas, after he betrays Jesus, he goes and he realizes what he's done. Again, he is still a lost man. But imagine he hears what's happening to Jesus. And what does he say? He says, I can't I betrayed innocent blood. He's had time to think about it, and he can't find one single moment where Jesus has ever done anything wrong. And even in his fallen, sinful state, he still has a conscience. And he tries to go back. And where's Jesus supposed to be? Remember, after you deliver a verdict, you're supposed to be there for 24 hours. So he goes to where Jesus is supposed to be, at the house of the of the priest. And he brings his money and he says, Take it back. Which what? That would have meant what? He was going to be killed. But his conscience was so strong that he comes and he says, Take your money back. I've 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 made a huge mistake. And they say, we don't want your money. And to spite them, we see that he says it throws it in the temple. But actually, if you look at that word temple, he threw it into the holy place. He threw it into the holy place. Because he wanted the priest and not just some person in the temple to have to clean it up. And they themselves call it blood money. But they don't care. He still had a conscience, but they say, huh, they collect it all, and they're like, ah, it's not right that we put this money in the offering because it's blood money. So we'll buy, we'll buy a pot of land over here, and we'll use it to bury people in. They call the own money that they used to give someone to betray Jesus blood money. And they pick it up without a conscience. They've been rushing this whole process. We gotta move, we gotta get we gotta put the pedal to the metal to move this process along. Because if Jesus' followers here, they're not gonna be happy about this. They're trying to rush it along. 
But ultimately what we see in this story is that God is in control even in this dark time. Jesus himself said, and it was important that it happened on this day because Pilate tries to get them. He says, if you want him dead, kill him your way, which meant stoning, right? And they're like, hey, we can't kill someone on on a feast day. That's our law. We need you to do it. But that was in accordance with scripture and with Jesus' own words. I will be lifted up. That meant death on a cross. And that only happened when the Romans did it. When the Gentiles performed an execution. It was all in accordance with God's word. And one of the most amazing things is that Jesus, when you read, he dies on Passover. But there was a three-hour window in which you were to make your sacrifices at the temple. Jesus himself, the perfect lamb of God. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world dies in the three-hour window of the sacrifices at the temple. And the temple curtain will be torn in two. It is God's timing. It is God's work that is being accomplished. No one can kill Jesus unless he lay down his life. And he did. This is the purpose for which he's come. I said at the beginning, this is some of the darkest moments in all of scripture. But it gives way to the greatest and the brightest moments in all of scripture. Jesus is providing payment that we could never pay. It is through his injustice that we are shown mercy. See today that the injustice that Jesus endured, the undeserving hatred and torture that he bore, see it. And he endured all of these so that he could show us unmerited, undeserving grace and mercy. If you're here and you know Christ as your Savior, see with a new heart, with new eyes, what Christ has done for you, how much he loves you, the lengths to which he was willing to go so that you could be a child of God. And so that we could have a high priest, not several of them, but one. A great high priest who is forever making intercession for us and is seated at the right hand of God. And not only that, he can sympathize with us. There is no injustice you can face that Christ has not faced greater. If you're here and you do not know Christ... For the same reason today, come and meet him. The God who loves you so much that he took your punishment for you because you could never meet the qualifications by yourself. He alone is our hope in life and in death. Jesus Christ, the one who embraced injustice and suffering so that he could embrace us. Give thanks today for what he has done. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your amazing love, grace, mercy that has been shown to us through the life, the the trial, the death, the burial, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, we are so grateful for what you have done, that you have made a way 
for sinful people to know you, to have a relationship with you, but Lord, much greater that we can be called your children. What an amazing gift. Help us to see today what you have done for us and help us to rejoice. And Lord, the proper response is to go and to tell others. So Lord, convict our hearts to share the beautiful message and the hope that we have because of what you have done for us. We praise you and we thank you. And it's in the wonderful name of your son, Jesus, that we pray and ask all of these things. Amen.